Welcome back to Rank and File Radio. Today you're going to be listening to our interview with David Camfield, who teaches labor studies at the University of Manitoba and recently authored Canadian Labor in Crisis, Reinventing the Workers' Movement that was published by Fernwood Press last year. Uh, We're going to ask him a few questions about the current state of the labor movement uh, in relation to the analysis that he provided in his uh, book. Hi, David. Hi. Um, So our first question... Your book has two major parts. The first part is an analysis, a bit of history, and a critique of the labor movement as it exists now, where it came from, why it's in uh, the situation it is now in terms of falling union density and uh, kind of a lack of militancy and ability to fight back against austerity measures. And then the second half of the book is really looking forward to how to reinvent the labor movement. So with those two general approaches in mind in your book, I was wondering... Since the election of the Tories, or really since the publication of your book, which is roughly the same time, I was wondering what you've seen in the labor movement and among workers in general uh, in terms of reinventing the labor movement, what sort of uh, positive aspects you've seen that tie into what you propose. Well, in, in my book, I have a section that I call Seeds of Hope, where I try to identify various kinds of... Uh, Examples um, where workers, whether unionized workers or, or workers acting other ways, um, are uh, have been engaged in actions which might maybe prefigure or give us a sense of uh, a different kind of movement. And these, are unfortunately, are not so many these days. They're, uh, you know, not so many. And also, it's difficult to uh, to chart them because there are really very few publications that try to actually identify and publicize the existence of these um, kinds of collective actions. So um, I think there are some examples we can look to that uh, are are inspiring. One that's very fresh uh, on my mind at the moment is uh, at Air Canada, where um, workers at Air Canada have really been through the ringer in the last decade, uh, having given major concessions when the company was uh, under bankruptcy protection and uh, now facing an employer that has been demanding to give up more. And so we saw recently uh, a situation where the federal labor minister, uh, Lisa Raitt, was passing through Pearson Airport, and a couple of baggage handlers slow clapped uh, in response to, to seeing her because the government had passed legislation which prevented them from uh, exercising the right to strike. Uh, in fact, they'd used this uh, obscure part of the Canada Labor Code to uh, send the the, uh, the set of negotiations to an investigation, which would mean that they suspended their right to strike, and then they brought it back to work legislation against them before they'd struck. Uh, and so in response to this uh, act of mocking the minister, these uh, workers were disciplined immediately, and uh, this then led to workers walking off the job uh, both at Pearson and at several other airports. Uh, and I think it was a, an example of direct action uh, which had a real impact on the company um, and really, for, the, for those who had uh, eyes to see, highlighted the, uh, the problems that workers are facing in our Canada. Um, and so I think it's, it's a, hope, it was a hopeful sign there for workers to take unofficial action uh, during the term of their collective agreement. This has become very rare in recent years. Um, Mm -hmm. The number of uh, midterm strikes, midterm contract strikes has has fallen to single-digit numbers in in the last couple of years, uh, historical lows. So that's one example. Uh, Another example would be uh, also in Canada, the way the pilots um, have been responding, the way they've been treated, again, having their uh, right to strike um, it's effectively taken away through back-to-work legislation. Uh, there, what's interesting is there have been what appears to be uh, forms of unofficial action where, where pilots have been calling in sick and uh, thereby disrupting the operations of the company. And what's, what's interesting about the most recent um, events, which took place at the end of last week, uh, is that it seems that there's a group um, uh, called 97 Squared, of it's an unofficial organization uh, of pro-union pilots at Air Canada who, uh, feeling that their official leaders have been, been handcuffed by the government and by its legislation, they have decided to organize themselves independently, 
issuing a statement saying our only way forward is via the grassroots movement and that is what we represent. Um, and recognizing that they have a lot of power as pilots, mm-hmm. as they say, um, without us there is no Air Canada, there are no departures and there's no revenue. If we stand united, protect each other, there's no danger to our pensions, to our scope, to our profession. Long after this faction of corporate raiders have left with their millions, we will still be here, as we have for the past 75 years. But the question is, what will be left? That's for us to decide. We must take it upon ourselves to fight back. Uh, And so this is interesting because uh, it's very rare these days for workers, uh, pro-union workers to organize unofficially, independent of the official union structures, um, to take action that, uh, you know, can use channels which are not open to the uh, the union officially, or if the union officially were to do it, then there would be very, very significant uh, fines or other legal repercussions. So uh, those are a couple of examples. And I'll just also mention one other, which is um, that in Toronto, where the municipal public sector workers have been up against Rob Ford's administration, very aggressive uh, right-wing government um, at uh, Toronto City Hall, and they've been having a lot of difficulties with cuts to jobs and cuts to services that have been brought back, brought in. Uh, but there has been a significant uh, fight back uh, against this in Toronto. It's not on the scale that's you know really necessary, but it's a lot better than what we've seen in, in some other places uh, where community neighborhood-based anti-cuts groups uh, have formed um, and have had some success in actually uh, pushing back at least net for now a uh, whole number of the cuts that the uh, Ford administration was trying to bring in. There still are cuts, but they're not on the same scale that the Ford administration was, was wanting to bring in. Uh, and so that kind of organization um, of pro-union um, anti-cuts activists working in the community uh, mobilizing around issues that affect working people, I think that needs to be seen as part of the working class movement. Uh, and uh, also, I guess, on a limited scale, we could say in Toronto, there's been the uh, recent the strike by library workers, Toronto public library workers, mm-hmm. who um, you know, managed to do literally better than I think um, recent strikes in the municipal public sector in, in Toronto have, have done. Uh, they did end up you know, having to give a significant concession, but they also made some gains in terms of uh, converting part-time jobs into full-time jobs for library workers, for a certain number of workers, and also for improving the benefit package for part-time workers. And those are gains that are very rare um, to win these days. Mm-hmm. Um, one last example, very quickly, uh, is uh, from Brock University, where a very small group of, of workers, 38 um, people who teach English as an additional language, uh, went on strike after the employer in a very bizarre move. Uh, they, they, they successfully negotiated a collective agreement, and then uh, they ratified it, and then the top echelons of the university administration refused to uh, accept the deal that had been actually negotiated by their own bargaining team. And so a strike uh, broke out, and uh, what was interesting there is that this small group of workers had a lot of support. Um, something like 30% of the faculty at Brock refused to cross their picket lines, uh, and large numbers of the contract faculty or sessional instructors, um, who like the um, ESL teachers or members of CUPE, uh, also refused to cross their lines, and so they actually won uh, a you know pretty clear-cut victory against uh, Brock University. And, uh, you know, this solidarity was, you know, on a much higher level than we usually see in uh, strikes on university campuses. It was critically enabled by the fact that the faculty union collective agreement has language that protects faculty uh, from being forced to cross picket lines that they don't want to cross. And there's similar, although not quite as strong language in the contract for the contract faculty. Um, But uh, that kind of solidarity between different groups of workers who all work for the same employer uh, I think is you know, is rare these days and um, quite significant. When it comes to organized labor, the elected leadership, and kind of organized labor's bureaucracy, that whole uh, administration, you're pretty critical of how it operates and how it places certain limits on a wide variety of aspects of uh, workers' abilities to fight back. Have you seen any of in the in the last year, any of your critiques confirmed, or if you had to 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 modify uh, what you see, or um, maybe if you can comment on that. Well, I guess I would love to say that I've been proven wrong because if <laughs> I was wrong about this, we'd be in a better situation. Uh, but I think that events have unfortunately confirmed the analysis, uh, and 
you know, a number of examples one could give. Um, there have been a number of uh, situations where widespread solidarity action, not just words, but real action, um, would have been very important in, in helping groups of workers. Um, and this kind of action was not forthcoming. So, for example, if we start on the West Coast and look at the, the BC Teachers Federation, uh, who you know, faced an absolutely reactionary piece of legislation which uh, removes, or prevent, you know, removes their ability to negotiate around the size and composition of classes. Composition refers to the number of special needs students in each class. Um, so in, in imposing through this piece of legislation, Bill 22, um, pieces of pre previous law that had been struck down by the BC Supreme Court. Um, so the T BC Teachers Federation was quite mobilized, but facing off against the provincial government more or less by itself. And uh, while there were various words of solidarity from the BC Federation of Labor Leadership and from the leaders of various affiliate unions within BC, um, there wasn't any action forthcoming, um, which really boxed in the teachers in terms of what they could do. And it was very similar uh, in the summer of 2011 when the Canadian Union of Postal Workers um, went on a series of rotating strikes that was then turned into a lockout by Canada Post Corporation. Um, you know, there was verbal support, uh, and people went to some rallies and so on. But there was there wasn't the kind of meaningful solidarity action that would have actually you know made a difference in the in the outcome of um, of that uh, of that dispute. Um, you know, one know one or two labor councils in the Maritimes uh, passed resolutions calling the Canadian Labor Congress to call a day of action to support the postal workers. But you know that was a, that was about it. Um, that was, you know, I think quite concerning. And then we saw at uh, Electromotive Diesel, um, where the Canadian auto workers there in uh, London, Ontario, at that plant owned by the multinational Caterpillar, uh, found themselves locked out. And uh, despite, a, you know, a significant day of action, public protest, uh, and some other forms of, of solidarity that were, were happening, um, there wasn't the kind of mobilization, um, strategic mobilization, strategic militancy that would have been necessary to actually give those workers a fighting chance of winning. And I think it's um, been recently pinpointed in an article written by uh, Herman Rosenfeld and published in the, the uh, e-newsletter, e e The Bullet, um, where he argues that uh, the leadership of the CAW essentially accepted that there was going to be a, a closing. Um, and it, the fight was you know, really about the you know, getting the, a decent package, you know, severance package and so on. The, the terms of the defeat would be what they were really going to negotiate. They weren't actually fighting to win. Um, and then, just to take another example, at, uh, at Air Canada, um, we've seen the federal government intervene now on several occasions um, to suspend the right to strike or walk out um, of workers at Air Canada when they were in a legal strike situation. Um, using this uh, completely disingenuous appeal to a provision of the Canada Labor Code, which uh, claims that there could be a threat to people's safety, uh, you know, health and safety. Um, and then by suspending the right to strike while well, that investigation is underway, supposedly that get, has given the government time to prepare the back-to-work legislation and to ram that through Parliament um, to send the unresolved issues to arbitration and then the legislation waits the outcome of the arbitration in the favor of the employer. And so um, it happened to flight attendants, it's happened to mechanics and baggage handlers, it's happened to, to pilots. Uh, and that was an outrageous attack on um, the right to free collective bargaining and the absence of, of action has been uh, really startling. Um, maybe the worst case was the flight attendants who are QP members who voted down democratically voted down uh, two tentative agreements negotiated by their bargaining team uh, and then were poised to strike when their legislation was brought in against them. And, you know, despite words of protest about the violation of collective bargaining rights that are involved in this, there was no no action taken. Um, and, you know, there were also, you know, in all these situations, groups of workers who were prepared to try to defend themselves in a time when so many workers were under attack were not given the kind of support that was necessary by the uh, official, uh, the official them, the official leadership of the labor movement. So those are some examples that stand out in my mind. You've already started to touch upon the question of the state. Um, perhaps it's impressionism, but it seems as though since the conservative government was elected last May, 
that there's been an uptick in the number of uh, threats as well as threats being carried out of back to work legislation and not simply in the public sector but also in the private sector with Air Canada. Do you see a changing role of the state in uh, labour capital relations in Canada at the moment or is this more evolutionary evolving out of something that's been going on long term? I would say it's the latter. It's more, I don't, I don't think it's a dramatic break. What is different is that the, the, you know, since the Conservatives got a majority in the House of Commons, they have been uh, definitely more aggressive in terms of using uh, the full extent of their state authority within their jurisdiction, which is people who work with the federal government and if federally regulated uh, industries like airlines uh, and the post office, um, to, you know, to intervene on the side of the employer. That's been very clear. And that it's not just an attack on those workers directly affected. It also is important in a political sense in that it sends a message to provincial governments. Um, it really is a kind of uh, get tough, get tougher kind of um, message that's, that's being sent here. And so I think that's, um, it's not by any means a dramatic change because this kind of state intervention um, has been happening some decades with increasing frequency. Um, but uh, since uh, 2007, there was an important Supreme Court ruling which um, raised the bar in terms of the legal test for government, you know, for state intervention um, that would interfere in, with, with collective bargaining. It did not, as some, unfortunately, as some observers said, uh, make it impossible. Um, but it, it, by extending some limited protection um, of the Charter of Rights to the freedom of association did make it more difficult for governments to uh, to do it. It held, held them to a higher test. Um, and so what's been interesting is the federal government has, you know, intervened in ways that, you know, they hope will meet the legal test that will survive legal challenges, um, but still are quite aggressively intervening on the side of the employer. And so I think that does encourage provincial governments to do the same. Not that many of them needed a lot of encouragement, but it, it does send a, a general uh, get tough message. And it's uh, also part of an ideological battle, which um, tries to question the legitimacy of unions and uh, question the legitimacy of unionized workers going on strike to defend their past gains um, in a, in a you know, context of a global economic crisis. And, so that's also about uh, you know, stigmatizing unionized workers in the eyes of, of other workers. Um, so I think it's both you know, directly intervening in particular situations that are seen as problematic by the government, but also they are you know, doing this with an eye to having a broader impact on society. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a question related to your book. You mentioned the necessity of unity between Quebec and uh, the rest of Canada's workers, English Canadian primarily. Um, can you elaborate on your position uh, about that unity, the unity of workers in uh, both Quebec and the rest of Canada, and and maybe talk a little bit about the the tensions and and what that means for the workers' movement? Why it's, as you argue, a weakness for uh, kind of either anti-Quebec feelings or any sort of uh, uh, yeah, anti-Quebec sentiment, why you think that is uh, problematic for the workers' movement. Okay. Um, so I, I see, just to be brief, I see um, the Canadian state as a colonial settler state established on the basis of the conquest of Indigenous peoples um, and then the subordination of um, what later became Quebec um, to you know, what we could call English Canada. Um, and so it's a, I see the Canadian state as a, as a multinational state, uh, but not one where the different nations within it are uh, existing on a level of uh, a level playing field. You know, it's not a situation of equality, mm -hmm. um, although much has changed um, in you know, the last 50 years. Um, people of Quebec and their majority consider themselves to be a nation, uh, but they do not have the legal right to um, determine their own future within the Canadian Constitution. They don't have the right to freely decide whether they would stay or leave the Federation. Um, and so this, there's a, a fault line then that, that runs through Canadian society, runs through Canadian politics. You know, this is the old two solitudes thing. It's not just about language, um, although that's certainly part of it. And, um, you know, so this is a, something which then when it comes to union organization, I mean, it's manifested in the fact that you have... Uh, 
uh, on a pan-Canadian level, one major labor federation, the Canadian Labor Congress, but within Quebec you have three major federations, only one of which is part of the Canadian Labor Congress. So you have an organizational gap there, you know, many, many unionized workers in Quebec not being part of um, the same you know, basic uh, institutional structure as the majority of unionized workers uh, within the state as a whole. Uh, and you have a general lack of understanding um, of the specific history and experiences and, and, and issues of um, you know, the Quebecois uh, mm-hmm. outside of Quebec. And um, people outside Quebec just tend to think of Quebec as one province. You know, within Quebec, um, the, the problem is, is different if you speak to you know, uh, like many left-wing Quebecois activists. They identify that you know, the, the problem that they end up confronting is that they end up often sort of thinking politically and acting politically uh, within a Quebec only a kind of a Quebec framework, mm-hmm. um, whereas, of course, the attacks that people face are being organized on a pan-Canadian level. Um, but we don't have uh, much in the way of an ability to organize a pan-Canadian response. Um, and so this is a, you know, it's an, on, it's an ongoing challenge here. And it's possible that this could become increasingly important in the future if, you know, we have, we have, remember, we have a situation now where there are very few Tory MPs from Quebec. Yep. Uh, and as the Harper government prosecutes its aggressive austerity agenda, and I know in its, its imperialist agenda, um, we could see its popularity fall still further within Quebec. Um, it you know, could lead to, you know, it's possible, depending on how it plays out, that it could lead to a revival of the, the Bloc Québécois, the Parti Québécois within Quebec, uh, particularly if the Harper government I mean, the Harper government has an interest in actually promoting that in a strange way. Um, be, on the one hand, they don't want a you know a strong movement for Quebec independence. On the other hand, they want to undermine the NDP in Quebec. And so, if they do things which um, you know would lead more Quebecois um, to support the the BQ rather than the NDP, that would actually be in the interests of the Harper government in terms of its electoral calculations. Um, so, if they you know there's a certain hot button issues that could be pressed. With, um, we've seen the Tories, you know, have a finely honed ability to do that when they think it's um, what you know will be good for them. Uh, and if that happens, so if there's a revo- you know re- any kind of revival of the national question in terms of discussion around Quebec independence or Quebec's place within Confederation, um, the labor movement outside Quebec is really poorly prepared to deal with it because of the, you know there hasn't really been any discussion about this since 1995 in the last referendum. Um, it's not part of people's uh, you know labor education, so people that aren't really well prepared to think about the political issues that would come up uh, and to navigate through those in a way that would build workers' unity um, in a way that's not unity at the lowest common denominator level, but unity on the basis of freely recognizing the right of the Quebecois to determine their own future. I guess, um, I didn't intend to ask this, but it's uh, you've brought up the NDP and uh, its uh, situation now in Quebec. And your book obviously touches upon the relationship with the NDP and the labor movement. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, having been through the recent leadership campaign and uh, pro-labor candidates like Peggy Nash having a very low vote, first vote. um, I was wondering if maybe you could comment on whether or not there's a changing relationship going on between organized labor uh, workers more generally in the NDP. I know it's a complex question, but any comment would be great. Okay. Um, well, I think there's two questions. You know, the relationship <laughs> of organized labor, like the labor leadership in the NDP, versus the relationship between the whole working class and the NDP. You're not, they're not the same questions exactly. But the, uh, you know, I think there there is. Um, it's complex because on the one hand, there's such a desire among so many people to get rid of the Tories that the pressures of um, lesser evilism are very strong. The kind of anybody but the Tories sentiment, right? Mm-hmm. I think is quite significant, and that leads lots of people, whether they're union officials or unionized workers or other people, um, to just you know because the conservatives are so awful uh, for so many reasons to not look too critically at the NDP, and now that the NDP is the official opposition to really put a lot of their eggs in or all their eggs in the basket of the NDP in terms of their hopes and aspirations for how we can stop the the agenda that the Harper government is prosecuting so aggressively. And um, so that on the, that is, it sort of politically reinforces the relationship. But at the same time, the uh, the relationship is changed by the fact that the 
uh, kind of institutional, formal ties between the labor official, the union official, and the NDP have loosened. You know, there wasn't the same structure of um, union vote representation in the process of selecting an NDP leader as has existed in the past, um, if you go back into the history of the NDP. Um, so the, there's a loosening of the formal ties um, you know, because the NDP leadership, above all, I think, wants to put some distance, greater distance between itself and uh, the union, of, the unions in general, but it wants to be able to continue to draw on the important volunteer energy that so many um, union members do give to the NDP. Um, so it wants to use them on the one hand, but to have uh, you know, even fewer uh, ties of obligation, mm-hmm. uh, I think, to, to, to unions on, on the other hand. Um, and this is only going to, I think, uh, increase with the election of Mulcair, who um, is the most Blairite, if you like, um, of the uh, you know the, the contenders for the NDP leadership, um, not someone who comes from the central traditional establishment of the party. Um, now, again, I think it would be a mistake to think that there was a real you know, debate involved in this. There, there was very little debate on policy at all. Um, there was an enormous political consensus. I would say this is, you know, the first, maybe the first, I guess the first time in, in a very long time that there wasn't any kind of left challenger um, from outside the, the party establishment um, to, uh, you know, to the other candidates. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's just something about the, the narrowing of political discussion um, within the NDP. And, uh, you know, because it costs fifteen thousand dollars to run a candidate, you know, the, the, the left wing of the party, which is extremely weak, you know, wasn't able to put up anybody for I think for part for financial reasons. But um, you know, I think that uh, you know you have on the one hand this, as I said, this uh, attempt to try to loosen the relationship coming from, especially from the NDP side of things, from the top brass of the NDP. Um, but you know, this is also a kind of a Maybe cementing might be too strong a word, but the the bonds are still very much there um, in terms of people's sentiments often because of the fact that defeating the Tories through extra parliamentary mobilization doesn't seem to be on the cards to, to people, and therefore voting about voting NDP seems to be the the option the most attractive. And uh, all this happening at a time of falling expectations where simply having a government that didn't aggressively kick people in the teeth on a regular basis would be seen as a great step forward by lots of people. And uh, so I think that's, you know, those are a few thoughts on the dynamic. What I haven't really addressed, and it's another whole question, is like, what is the NDP today? You know, what, is it, what has it become? Um, you know, is it the same party that it was in 1988 when under Ed Broadbent, you know, it fought against the free trade um, deal with the U.S., you know, and when it was you know, in a certain mold. I think there have been a lot of changes since then, and that's something which uh, left-wing analysis needs to work on. That concludes Rank and File Radio's interview with David Camfield, professor of labor studies at the University of Manitoba and author of Canadian Labor in Crisis, Reinventing the Workers' Movement, published in 2011 by Fernwood Publishing. Join us next Wednesday, 5.30 to 6 p.m. on CFRC 101.9 FM. Stay tuned. <laughs>